All right, thank you. And let's see your little iPod pad kind of thing over here, out of the way. So um, I, I didn't uh, go into um, some extra announcements we were going to make today. So all I'm going to say is go away. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's what we use to play the music here, but we're not doing the song this morning. So it's throwing a tantrum. <laughs> I want to play a song. So I didn't make an announcement, so very briefly, let me just share that, you know, as usual, we have um, our chaplains available after service, so just let them know. They'll be standing against the side walls. If you'd like, uh, after service, hands-on healing or prayer, whatever you're looking for, they can take you aside to a private area and um, ask you, you know, help, have you work with them, all right? So I'll share the rest of the announcements after, assuming I remember to do so. All right. Now, in the meantime, uh, I, I shared with you guys when we started last week that that uh, had an interesting thing happen. You know, there was this lady um, sent an email and sort of reprimanding uh, about how I wasn't a very spiritual or good teacher because I talk about things that are just silly, like angels and fairies and things, that those things don't exist. And I should know that if I was a decent teacher. So she's going to leave us, you know, and she's moving on to to probably some I don't know what, <laughs> you know, some, uh, you know, very shallow kind of thing, you know, that where they just say the same thing every week. So um, that's good. She should probably do that. Um, so I thought, you know what, in, in, in honor of her, I'm, today I'm going to talk about Lemuria. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> this will, if she was on the fence, this will help her. Humpty Dumpty. Mm. You out of here. So I thought, yeah, that would be great. And, and some other folks had been asking this week, you know, that, yeah, well, that would be just fantastic. So I thought, okay. So I, how does that fit into a Sunday church service, a spiritual center service and so on? Uh, you know, this is, it's funny because people actually think there's a positive thinking church. There's a Catholic church. There's a, you know, a pagan group. There's a, all of these things started as one. So I, that's what I teach, and it seems like I'm arbitrary to some. They're going, where, where does this guy come from? Angels? Fairies? Lemuria? Really? They think it's arbitrary. Because separated people, separated minds, need separated conversations. <laughs> Their brains are separated, so they, they need just one little thing to believe in. And then they go, you know, because I'm a Catholic. Oh, well, I'm a Buddhist. Well, I'm a... It's all the same, bloody hell, people. It's all the same. That's the British uh, coming out. But I'm not British, so I probably shouldn't have said it. Sorry. I was channeling Roger. All right? His I fault. I do not say, I do not swear. I never have. <laughs> so, so the thing, think about this. It's not, they're all, they're all the same. The origins, all of it is real. All of it's true. There are light beings. That's not an arbitrary conversation. You think I'm arbitrary when I bring these things up? Arbitrary is to separate them out. So it was all and is all true. Mythologies, the stories of gods, goddesses of Greek mythology. I mean, it's so, it's so odd to me. And I understand it. I understand that humans are messed up. So they need to have their little isms and their little shticks and whatever. But everything is connected. When people talked about Hercules in Greece, they were talking about Samson in Israel. The legends are of the same person, and sometimes it's not the same person, it's the same archetype that manifests in different cultures. But at one time, there weren't different cultures so much. There was a global communication. There was a global understanding. So, you know, we, we, we started off one with God. And just like when you're looking at a fire and then poof, little sparks pop, pop, and those little sparks come flying off the fire, that's us. Once the original fire of God and little sparks, and that's us, except it happened at once where a countless number went pop. That's called the separation. Where we all seemingly flew into the darkness and onto the lawn 
you know, or wherever we, onto the sand or wherever the sparks flew, but they left the original fire. If you took one of those sparks that, however, it's still from that original source. Just because it popped and landed on the, the, the grass or the sand over there doesn't mean it didn't. It looks like it's from a separate source, but it isn't. It's not sitting there burning independently. It came from something that gave it its fire. So we have the Spirit of God in us. That's that original fire. Just like the embers will eventually go out, that's a metaphor of us going to sleep and forgetting our divine fire. The ember goes out, it goes quiet. You could throw it back in the fire and it might light up again. That's you and I getting in touch with God and we feel inspired again and we're lit up again. It's great. But what looks pop, separate. But it wasn't just souls that became you and me. The, sometimes there's a loud pop and a bigger piece flies off. Those bigger piece, pieces became, you could say, archetypes in the universe, God, goddess type archetypes, or sometimes planetary beings. I mean, even planets are beings, but people forget, they separate everything. It becomes astronomy where you just measure a planet. You know, that's kind of, that's called objectifying, by the way. The word objectifying isn't something you just do to women. Anything you see as an object is objectifying. That's what the word means. You're making into an object. So a woman can say, oh, I hate being objectified, made like I'm some object. Well, you know, you, what you would like, you, you, what you would hate even, you know, more? You think you hate being objectified? You would hate even more if we didn't even see you as an object. I can't even see you. You'd be like, how come you're ignoring me? Because I don't want to see you as an object. <laughs> There's one thing better and greater than not objectifying and it's experiencing. I, I choose to know you, not see you, know you. In the Bible, it's kind of funny because I'm going to, whatever, I'm going to bring all kinds of things in, I guess. In the Bible, the original word for having intimacy, instead of, you know, using other words for it, but, it, it, you know, having intimacy, it was called knowing someone. And then he knew her meant, uh, you know, yeah. woohoo. <laughs> but why do you think they use that wording? Think about that. Because originally it was about knowing them, connecting with them. It wasn't nice legs, let's do something. It's, you know, that's objectifying, but that's humans. That's the humans that fell and fell and fell and fell. And the ember went out. The fire went out. They lost sight of themselves. So what do you expect them to do? They're just little bits of, you know, some sort of, uh, whether it's wood or some other product that they're burning. It's just, you're just an ember that's gone out. And so in the desperation of being an ember that has no flame, no fire, no spark, you're bored and you're lonely, so you hit on each other and see each other as objects because there's nothing else to do when you're a little chunk of wood sitting on the sand. Hey, how are you doing over there? You know, <laughs> can you ignite me again? And that's what relationships and codependence and drugs are all about and drinking. Everybody's looking for something to ignite them again. But you're asking other cold, dead things to ignite you. <laughs> Is this Valentine's Day or something? Yeah. <laughs> Sounding real romantic. Okay. So, poof, we all flew away. And we all became the spirit sparks flying into a universe that was starting. It's the womb of the mother that went to the father. I'm going to birth them. They're thinking that they're leaving. So I'm going to help go in with them to a place we're going to create together, co-creating the universe. So she, the womb, is expanding to receive these little sparks or embryos that are us. And we flew into the universe, this vast universe that is the consciousness, womb metaphorically, the consciousness of the mother and the Holy Spirit of God. So she's here saying, I'll just mirror wherever you're at. I'll mirror wherever you're at. Every day, every thought, every emotion, I'm just going to be here mirroring this for you. And so we fly in what seems to be a vast universe, and it's just a dream experience, but... Let's just go with it as though it's happening for real, real time. So the universe is expanding. And all of a sudden in there, there's all these fiery nebula kind of this energy, you know, this churning in the universe, just as they say the universe would have been at the Big Bang, this fiery, just kind of celestial movement, this dance of energy. But then those things start densifying and becoming suns that blow off planets, that blow off moons, etc. We're in the meantime flying in and we're saying, what is this? What, what happened? I don't know what happened. One minute it seems like we were one with something, God, and yet now we're flying into a dark 
universe. What are we and where are we? So in one respect, there's the sadness of having lost something that we knew was there a moment ago. And that's a sadness that no human being can understand. You think you're sad when you lose a loved one. When you lost everyone, including God, that was a sadness that was unbearable. So we chose to forget it. We chose to pretend, you know, we, that's where the ego was created. We need to create a, vi a, a virus in our mind. We need to download a virus that will make us not have to deal with what we're feeling. So the, the separation was one thing. To try to hide from our emotions was even worse. And that's why the concept of responsibility is so important. Because if you truly take responsibility, you're not taking responsibility for all the naughty things you've done. You're taking responsibility for thinking you could have done anything other than love. Then it would disappear. So the ego makes you afraid of responsibility because if you take true responsibility, you'll reverse the separation and we'll go home. And the ego doesn't exist at home. So it's telling you for its own survival reasons, don't go there. Now, done. We fly in and some of us went to the Syrian star system. Some went to the Arcturian star system. Some of us came to this star system. Those of us who gravitated here, we gravitated here. Now, now some of us moved from different places, and I know this can sound a little out there, but it starts one with God, it's going to end one with God. God wills that no soul shall perish means everyone's going home. It's actually not going to be a few of us make it and every other being goes to hell. I mean, that's like, that's like the worst story you could ever have come up with. You know, like the, the only... A few can make it, and then everything's futile then. And then religions are even telling you're born with sin, your original sin. You don't stand a chance. So some religions don't even try to make it look good, like it might work. One religion's going, you know, I know there's trillions of us, but only 144,000 can make it. <laughs> That's like really wicked. And then there's Far Eastern traditions that say, no, we don't believe in that. Technically, you'll reincarnate until all of us make it but they forget to tell you which is going to take a trillion years. That's, I might as well just send me to hell because that is hell to me. If I've got to come back and have 3,000 lifetimes or 50,000 lifetimes working on myself, I think this time I'll just work on smoking. Next time I'll work on drinking. Next time I'll try to have a head of hair and whatever else is important to you, whatever else is important to you. If you keep waiting for everything to be perfect, enough lifetimes, it's like, you know what, never mind. Just, just trapdoor me. Let me go to hell now because it's all the same. So whether you believe Far Eastern, whether you believe Christian 144,000 or whatever else, none of these are really good. The only good outcome is we all go home. We're all in this together and we're all going to go home. God is one. The Lord that God is one means we're part of that one and that means half of us can't make it and half of us not. God would not be God if it was only half present. So we're all going to make it. But in the meantime, we flew into these universes and we were, you could say, in soul bodies, almost like undefined energy, light. And eventually, as time's going on, there's some people that gravitated to this star system, some to others, but let's work with this star system. If you're here wishing you were in another star system, you're already failing your test. Because all that means is I don't like where I am and I don't want to deal with the, the issues and feelings that make me wish I were elsewhere. I mean, I don't care if you're doing this in your relationship, at a job, or in the star system. Wishing you were somewhere else tells us you're wounded here and you need to work on that. Yeah, but I wouldn't if I got to go to some other place. No, that's why you're not in that other place. So they sent you here to work on something. So just own it. So in this star system, we come in and some of us are going through, again, we're not defined bodies, so you're able to move into existence in planets and so on. Because there's different frequencies, different lessons, different energies going on in our musical scale called our planetary system. And it is a musical scale. Our planets each have musical notes to them. So you're coming in to experience the song of this star system. So now, when we do come in, we're coming in as soul bodies, soul beings. 
gradually, as we come into the earth plane, we started becoming a little bit more what we would call astral bodies, astral beings. Astral is like your ghost. But if I right now leave this body and enter my astral body, I would look like a ghost of Michael because we all remembered Michael, so my astral body would look like Michael. But when you're first coming in, there was no other person you were, so the astral self doesn't look like a person. It's just a tad more dense than pure energy. And pure energy, I'm saying you're still a, a being, but sort of a cloud of light, we'll call it. So we start taking on astral bodies. Now, where we gravitated, where life was starting on planet Earth primarily as a place called Lemuria. I know it sounds fabulistic even more than Atlantis, so it's okay. Just hang in there as best you can. Think of this as a flashback, all right? <laughs> Just a, a weird trip you're having, okay? So, so we come in and we're taking on these astral soul bodies, mixture of soul body and astral body, and we're coming in and we're going, where are we? Where, where are we? Like, but the planet is forming. And gradually you have your prehistoric creatures here. And we're looking at the foliage and water and, you know, these creatures. And we're going, what, 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 where are we? And so what we had, the gift that we still maintain, was the ability to create through thought. So we would say to ourselves, I wonder what that is. And we actually projected ourselves even into objects. The problem is... When we, in this pure state, the beautiful state really, but we're in this pure state, when we project it into things, you start densifying as much as that thing is. Is that making sense? If I'm, let's pretend I'm, uh, let's, let's give it a rating. Out of 100 possibilities, I'm, or let's use 10. Out of 10 ratio of possibilities vibrationally, I'm like at a nine. I project into a creature, I'm a two. And a two can't do the things a nine can. So we projected ourselves into things and didn't know how to get out. And this was even further what we call the fall. This is where the mythologies of, of creatures, uh, where, which were half centaur and half man, and that, that's what the mythologies of really of the Atlantean period were telling us about. Souls had gone into creatures, created half this, half that. It became really weird sci-fi. But it all did happen. Those, those pictures of beings being half of this and half of that, they are, if not literal, they are metaphorically depicting that we got lost and became mixed in with things. Now, not all of us. Some of us did. Some of us projected into uh, 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 anthropoids and other kinds of creatures. Some of us just gradually denser and we became denser and started materializing into body-like forms astral bodies, etheric bodies, and then eventually body. But we decided to formulate human bodies, slightly different than they are now, but roughly the same. Now, when we did that, we became groups, uh, like tribes, primitive type tribes. So you have some beings that densified into, let's call it tribal beings. Some of us projected into things, anthropoids and other kinds of things. Some of us did not choose to densify all the way at all. We remained kind of like etheric light bodies. Those who remained like that remained like the guides. In other words, what you see today as a spiritual teacher with groups, in those days it would have been the etheric kind of person speaking to the tribes. Does that make sense? Okay. And they would be telling them what? They would be telling them, listen, we forgot, we separated, we forgot, and we need to remember who we are which is exactly what we're doing today. So I love the fact that whether you call it Lemurian or whether you call it today, all of it's the same. We went on a bizarre journey without distance to a place we never left. And all we're needing to do is remember. So the etheric priestess, goddess, because it was primarily a feminine leadership in those days, was trying to encourage children Let's try to remember, let's go home. But you're now talking to beings that were projected into dense bodies and they couldn't even understand what you were saying. So the teachers really had to try to dumb it down, for lack of a better word, just, you know, dumb it down and speak to them at such a primitive level. And that's where we got stuck and it became, it's gonna take millions of years of evolution to wake up. Why? Because we allowed ourselves to get that far gone. 
Now, <clears throat> time's an illusion. The bodies are an illusion, but the belief systems densified. When your beliefs become dense, like money doesn't grow on trees, guess what happens? Money doesn't grow on trees. But when you start to wake up, you go, wait a minute, money doesn't grow on trees. I don't like that saying anymore. So the first thing you're going to do is see that you don't like that. The second thing you're going to do is figure out how to chop up a tree and sell firewood. Now money does metaphorically grow on trees. And that's ingenious, but that's not all the way home. There's still another level where you actually can manifest money on trees. But that could be your reality. The world will not support that. Eventually, the Treasury Department's going to come knocking on your door. Excuse me. There's these $100 bills circulating. And, um, you know, it's kind of odd because the serial number, it's, it's like, you know, instead of instead of a long serial number, you just have one. And you're like, isn't that wonderful? We're all one and we can create whatever. No, they're, they're just going to haul you away. <clears throat> so this world doesn't support this. So we divide it into three primary groups, the, the Lemurian experience. And um, in a way, one of the positives about what we were able to do as Lemurians is, is we, we were experimenting with how to use our minds to manifest but we were manifesting separation, fear, fear created density rather than awakening. And that's why even today, we're still needing to go back and correct that original thought. I'm gonna use my mind and I'm gonna start believing that we can, we can create, we can manifest anything. A being could actually have a child by believing itself to be impregnated with a new creation. And then she, if it was a female vibe, she could then give birth. So immaculate conception was still able to happen back then. Mary was just able to hold the same mindset as a Lemurian that I can create with my mind. And she did immaculately conceive. Humans don't like to hear these things because they can't remember how to do it. So they diss the whole thing. We need to go back to magical thinking. We need to go back to miraculous thinking. And realizing, God, it's the wonderment. It's a childlike mind that we can do anything. And, you know, then they're going to tell you, you know, we think you have Asperger's. We think you have autism, you know, because you're one of those believers in miracles. And that's why those kinds of groups, what they think to be malfunctions, mental malfunctions, are actually having a deeper understanding of the real thing. But they look messed up because they're trying to speak to people that are messed up. You see what I'm saying? Like, but they're the ones with the problem. And, and that, that what seems like hypersensitive are simply more etheric. But they can't get all of it articulated to three-dimensional minds. Even as I stand here speaking about Lemuria. What were Lemurians like, Michael? I don't know. Which group? You want me to tell you about the etheric kind of Lemurians or the tribal ones? Or the ones that were projected into objects? One from another. They're different. The, the Romans are the ones that coined that phrase. They called these people Lemurians. Because even the, Ro Rom the Romans knew about this continent that was in the Pacific. The high mountain areas of the of Lemurian continent are now what, the Pol are what we call the Polynesian Islands. It slowly submerged and became the highlands, highlands became the Polynesian Islands. It, it, this is all true. You know, these things can be easily proven just by weaving all of it together. It all makes sense. But the Romans called Lemuria and the, the inhabitants Lemurians because it meant ghost people. So the Romans even knew from mythologies and stories passed down only 2,000 years ago, knew about these people, the Lemurians, and called them ghost people. Why? Because they were astral and or etheric beings. See, even they understood it to this time of their their you know, civilization. So Lemurians, what are they like? You know, and they last for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So they're different from the day we arrived compared to the day it submerged because over time they got denser and denser. Still, there were the etheric teachers, masters trying to get people home. And one of the great things, the gifts was the, the, the belief that thought can create instantaneously. So 
The downside of thought manifesting was that they projected themselves into matter and got stuck. The positive was from here, from the mind, they knew how to project. So what they would do is project uh, um, lessons, teachings into things like crystals so that people could hold the crystals and download information. See, that came from the Lemurian skill of thought projection. So you have Lemurian crystals or objects that you think is just an object, but it's like a, an Indiana Jones movie. Somebody can hold this thing and, you know, it starts downloading. The Great Pyramid is made out of quartz because the entire thing, because quartz holds memory, but you have to know how to unlock it. So I, when I sit and tune in, you know, it's like, God, it's, I just see and experience and can understand this whole Lemurian concept. Here's another thing. The Lemurians didn't have memory because memory is based on your opinions of what happened in the past. But they were so childlike, everything was in the moment. It either is or it isn't. You don't go, yeah, but don't you remember? No. <laughs> is it here now? No. Well, then that's it. So they were just from this, wow, like what a cool place to kind of, you know, be centered in. So not having had memory, they could project thoughts into objects so that things could be in a pseudo kind of way memorized in cells of, uh, or in structure of a, of a crystal, for example, so that someone could have an odd way of going back to have memories of life, let's say, in Lemuria or mankind's existence. Because we, we, we don't have memory, so we only have now, we're going to project what we have now and know now into these objects. Is that making sense? And that's why some of you are like into the stones, you know, the rocks and minerals and feeling that kind of the magic of, you know, of minerals or stones, crystals and so on. So Lemurians didn't consider things based on the past or, or even contemplating the future. They just kind of came from a place of what, what's happening now. Now, and, and in that innocence, that also, the innocence became a target. The, way as, the same way human beings today, when you're very simple, very naive, very childlike, it often, all too often on this planet, you become a target for predators, right? That originated right there. Lemuria is where we have the cellular memory, genetic memory of something going wrong like that. And, and that, that gets very tripped out, so I'm not going to go too far into that. I'm just saying that the gradual demise of the Lemurian civilization was partly because of the predators coming in and uh, you know, having such an ill effect on these beautiful, innocent-like beings. And then that's where we segue into the aggressive, masculine kind of uh, Atlantean civilization. But that's you know, another thing. Now, here's something else that's interesting. The language of Lemurians, the closest you would know today would be, would be like Native Americans, where something is like dit, dot, dot, you know, like a few short words. The language, though, is, was never about, like if I, uh, in A Course in Miracles, you're told, do an exercise. I don't know what this cup is for. I don't know what this pen is for. Because... You, you only know things based on your memory of what you were told about it. There's no in-the-moment experience. So the course in its workbook lessons is trying to get you to unplug your memories of what you think is true and experience them differently as the moment. Okay. <clears throat> so the language of Lemurians was not, Hi, honey, come here, your child, you know, this is a podium. Podium, got it where everything is so linear and memorized. They don't have memory. So they had to always experience, and their language would be something that reflects the present moment. So essentially, it's kind of like sending out on a radar. You send out a signal and it hits something, so it's beep, beep, right? You send out a signal and it bounces off of the object you're sending the signal to. Sort of like that. When you experienced a tree it wasn't, oh, look, that's a tree, just like I was told. That's a tall tree. Where do you get that it's tall? How do you know it's tall? Well, because I can see it. How do you know? Because I've seen tall trees before, and I was told the word tall. That's not how they were. They would be with something, experience it, totally fresh. Then there's a signal that comes from the mind. 
you know, sort of like, who are you? What are you? That signal goes out. The thing answers. Thank you. Thank you for asking. See, a woman too. Thank you for asking instead of hi, tall, blonde, whatever. You know, you're, you're this race. You're the, no, no opinions. There's no past. There's no memory. So it's constantly, I don't know. You tell me. So you send out that frequency. The thing responds with its vibration. When the vibration comes back to the person, syllables pop out of their mouth or little short words come out. You know, hep, sup, or whatever. And you just named it, but you didn't give it your opinion of its identity. You asked the thing what it was, and it revealed itself to you. Doesn't that sound amazing? Yeah. I appreciate you, I'm, you know, saying that, because I, otherwise I'd sit here going, oh, Michael, stop talking. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, if I'm the only one that thinks this is amazing, I probably should change the subject. Let's talk about positive thinking. Um, <laughs> So, so it's, it's, to me, it's beautiful. It, you, you allow it to convey its name. I've done workshops. I even took a group once, a Sacred Sites tours, many, many, many years ago, even before I moved here, obviously. And I took a group up to one of the Red Rocks, and we sat, and I was ask, explaining this to them. Ask that plant what its name is. And you can't just, you know, like, fake it. You don't want to just get into faking things like that. Tune in and ask it. And... It was amazing because several people in the group would come up with the same name. And that is the, you know, very slim chance. And they would come up with the same name. But even more important than it proving itself factually is when you look at water, a stream, and you're asking it. I mean, it's, you now, you join with it. You experience it. You know, even every topic, intimacy, where somebody does someone, like that's bizarre. That would be foreign to a, a Lemurian mind. Now we have things like, you know, sacred spaces, sacred intimacy, sacred foods. To Lemurians, they would wonder what you're talking about because everything had to be sacred. It was, that's all they knew. How could I cook a meal and it not be sacred? You don't have any respect for me. I don't know why I'm even making you any food. Rat poison, rat poison. You know, you know humans. How could I not sit and think, oh, and I'm, I'm feeling like this is good today, and I'm feeling like the children, a little extra nutrient, and everything is like so consci conscious and conscientious. How wonderful if the blend of this would would taste wonderful for people. See, everything's sacred. Intimacy, it can't be anything but. Who are you? Let's reveal ourselves. What humans do is undress to reveal themselves. Lemurians are like, what are you doing? I'm taking my clothes. Why? To reveal myself. Really? You have to actually move stuff? You can't just like, you know, in consciousness, oh, here I am. You know, no, no, I have to, garments. You know, and wow. And when you get really excited, they go off faster. Wow, that's really hot. No, it's shallow. I understand that people dig it, and good for you. But there's another way. The, the, the Lemurians, everything was sacred. From cooking, parenting, every, gardening, everything was done from a sacred space. And if you think about it, you, a part of you is going, wow, that sounds amazing. Think a little further and realize it also sounds exhausting if you really are honest with yourself, that to try to remember to be that conscious constantly. Okay, I'm going to drive to work, but for a moment, let me just, you know. Sometimes you're like, I'm already late, I can't. And then you're like, I'm going to do a sacred, a sacred ceremony this morning and totally commune with God for a moment. And the kids, blah, 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 and it's like, pfft. and you just get used to this world. So now doing things right seems tiring. But the truth is, not doing them right is what tires us. But you can't convince people of that anymore because they're so programmed with opposite thinking. You know, I'd like to go off the drug addiction, but man, there's all kinds of negative effects and withdrawals. And somebody told you that and you believed it so that you'd have a reason to not get off the drugs. The truth is, it's harder to stay on them. It's more effort to stay addicted to things that aren't real than it is to surrender to the only thing that is real. God, love. 
the light of God, you know? So instead of seeing things in their true interaction of vibration, humans have segmented all because separation becomes separation, becomes separation, almost like reversing fractals, you know, it just keeps breaking down, breaking down to further separation till people, you know, walk down the street, hey, you know, where's the namaste, where's the aloha, where, where's the, the sacred greeting? And now it's like, hey, you know, like these grunt, <laughs> grunting, like, you know, weird, you know, and, and intimacy becomes something like two rocks being pounded together and, you know, like, like everything's so dense and so weird. Hey, what's up? What's up? What's up? Hey, man. Uh, uh. But, but where's, the, where's the, you know, connecting? Well, here's where connecting is. You, you know, you're at the bank and you go to do the, you know, and the teller's like, okay, and there's a line of people behind you, especially at Chase, but never mind. Okay? <laughs> there's a line of people behind you and they're all like, you know, tapping their foot and whatever. And your turn. And you're like, Okay, before I give you my deposit, can I just, can we take a moment so I can just know who you are and I want, that way energetically I can give you thanks for taking my deposit. You know, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to get a manager. I mean, that's where it goes. In this world, that's what happens. Get pulled over by a cop and go, before you write me up, let me, sir, wh where were you going? Where were you? Let me see your registration. Well, that's all an illusion. Just give me a minute to, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't go well, usually. I try those things and I get them to laugh and that's always fun. But, you know, this world just doesn't, doesn't support it. If your baby's crying and needs change or fed right now, you, you really, it doesn't seem practical to go, I know you're not comfortable, but let's be for a minute. No, you know what? Take care of the ache. Take care of what seems to be happening. The problem with the human race is it's okay to take care of the immediate call that you think is real and important and then come back to spirit. The problem is they don't come back to spirit. They do that immediate thing, then they do another immediate thing, and then another. There's no, I'll do the immediate because that's what I need to do, respecting the illusion, but let me also come back to gratitude. Now that the baby's not crying because of need it's fed, let me hold it and just appreciate it and ask what it really is. Just like ancient cultures, they would ask the child to reveal its name. And today they're like, what do you mean, ask the child its name? It can't even speak. It's not even born yet. How can you ask the child? They think you're ridiculous. I mean, I heard all that stuff when I had kids. I mean, you know, it's like, oh, what are you going to name it? Running water. You know, like, <laughs> you know, they would, just, they would just make fun of these things. And, you know, knowing that they're asleep, I could just be related to these people for another couple of years. Then I was like, bye. I gave it another couple years where I was like, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. Very clearly, evidently, they know not what they do. They know not what they say. They know nothing. So it was easy to get used to the, the cynical comments. <coughs> but why, why did ancient civilizations ask? Because that's what they did with everything. It wasn't just the children. It was everything. I don't know what anything's for. Why do you think A Course in Miracles tells you that in a workbook lesson? I don't know what anything's for because it's trying to get us back to that Lemurian Eden-like consciousness. I don't know. So ask, what are you? I want to experience you when we make love and I want to experience these foods. What's it doing? Well, this food gives me all that my body thinks it needs. You see, you can even command because that's that original using the mind to create. And, you know, I remember Yogananda sharing particular stories of magnificent stories about how, well, we needed something for our property once. And I said, let's go looking for. And we went looking for. I knew exactly what I wanted. I told my assistants, here's exactly what we're going to find. They're like, where are you going to find something that specific? That's too arbitrary. Like, we want to get a gate, and the gate needs to be 10 feet wide, but most gates are only six, and we want a 10. And on the gate, we want it to have wrought iron of a certain color, and we want to have spots on it that we can glue gemstones or whatever. And they're like, you're, okay. You know, and they went to some place, you know, and they checked it out, and they're like, junkyard or whatever, and looked around, no, no. And then he just says, do you happen to have a gate that's in the Oh, yeah, I have just that thing right back here, you know, hidden behind the building. And, you know, people around Yogananda, they're like, this guy's a trip. No, he's just in his original consciousness. We can create anything. 
And the Lemurians did that for good and for ill. I say the Lemurians, but really, we were doing that as we came in to Lemuria. We just manifested it more in that time. Our consciousness, we, we do create, not we once could, we still do. It's just that we're not creating well. We're not creating from connectedness and love. We're creating from fear and anxiety, from separation. I need to create this because someone else is going to create it if I don't. You know, there's, you know, musicians. I mean, I've shared the story before, but, you know, Michael Jackson was kind of neurotic in a million different ways. But one of his eccentricities was he would say, you know, he would get really anxious about getting a song just right and the musicians getting it just right. And they were like, why are you so uptight? And he goes, well, if we don't do this right, God's going to give the song to Prince instead. Well, <laughs> you know, like, wow, really? Why don't you just enjoy the song that's coming through instead of competing it with, well, if, if I don't get it right, God's going to give the song to Prince. Really? You know, like, it's like, wow. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on. You know, this is the, the competitive or the fear-based and... And then you have more of that going on in your life. Back, back to our original self. Back to our original consciousness. I am as God created me, or I'm not as God created me. We start every day just like that. With the, we talked about this the last few weeks, identity. I am or I'm not. And we're constantly asked by the universe, who are you today? I don't know, but I'm not connected. And so it is. And the universe will absolutely have to manifest an image of that for you because that's what she's there for. Always to show us our consciousness. Hoping that you will reach your pain tolerance sooner than later. And say, you know what? Enough is enough. Maybe I am as God created. Maybe I am divine. Now things improve because you're saying maybe. But you're not absolute. And then the maybe needs to eventually turn into certainty. And certainty has to eventually become the absolute. There's not even a certainty versus an uncertainty. There's just the truth of God. And that's where we're at. That's where we're going. The things that are happening in the world are tests. We're doing a, 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 a workshop, but even if it's not the workshop. My book called, You're Not Going Crazy, You're Just Waking Up. I, I, you know, this is about explaining how we got into this mess and how it needs to be turned around. The waking up seems challenging for people. The, the truth is, part of you, the original spirit spark, never went to sleep. So when you think you're evolving and waking up, you're really just peeling layers off to who you really are. So I look at this world and I think, man, sometimes it's, we have certainly, we have lost something. I remember uh, the band Yes has a ba an album called Tales from Topographic Oceans. And um, the re first song on it, which is half an album length, it's called The Revealing Science of God. You know, yes, they, they did everything so deep, right? The Revealing Science of God, but just in a nutshell, there's, there's so many lines in that song that blow the mind because he's talking about, I can't believe that we lost what we originally had. He says those words and they're like, I, I just can't believe we forgot. And it's exactly right because he's describing, which by, that, uh, by the way, that album was inspired by autobiography of a yogi, Yogananda, life story. So he writes this whole album based on, you know, the uh, major parts of the teachings of, of Yogananda and the Vedas and so on. But this first out, the first side is all about once upon a time, there was this connection I'm paraphrasing, but not by much. And this explosion took place and we all flew into the universe and we're going to learn and experience and so on and so on. And then he gets to parts of the song and he's going, what happened? How, how did we forget what we really came here for? How did we forget our origins? You know, and he, he, in his lyrical style, he's talking about, you know, the fall and vibration changes. He's very deep the way he does these things. But inevitably at the end of the song he does this chant that's about you know everything's going to come back to love for you and you and you and that's the closing of the song everything's going to come back to this place but why take so long you know why so much hurt in the meantime and it doesn't have to take so much pain and suffering to get back to that place to think sacred to think oneness 
Um, you know, there's a great, great line, um, you know, off by a word or two only, from A Course in Miracles that I love, which is kind of like saying, I choose today to only think thoughts that God would have me think. And that's been on my mind for several days now. I can have a thought about someone, positive or negative, doesn't matter. I just say, but I choose to only think of this person as God would have me think of them. Here's an event, and I would only choose to, and I would only choose to see that as God would have me see it. See, the Lemurians were actually doing that. They weren't just praying for it. They were doing it because that's all they knew because they just came in. So they hadn't had so many layers of pain and hurt and resentment and forgetting and so on layered over them. So when we affirm, let me see this through God's eyes, you're actually choosing to remember. Lemuria is kind of like talking about Eden, where it, it's a civilization, it's a world of beauty and oneness. And people lived in such perfect harmony. And when, like I said, when they verbalize things, it's, you're, you're actually verbalizing the vibration of the thing in front of you or before you in this particular moment. And it's just, it's almost like a poetic-like way of experiencing life. It's, what are, what are you telling me? Or, or like somebody writing song lyrics. You know, like what, what needs to go in that line right there? Or architecture. You know, there are architects who didn't say, I'm going to build a house right there. What they would say is, what do you want me to build there? They would ask the land. Certain, you've heard of these kinds of architects, right? And they say, what, it's already there, etherically. Energetically, every space already has everything else. So you're just asking, what is the right thing to bring through to that line in the song? What's the right thing for that hillside for a house? When you do that, when you build from a sacred architecture, things last longer. And that's why there, you know, your house will not look the way some of the ruins of, of Rome look. And ruins of Rome were destroyed by people. They would still be standing. Your house wouldn't. Your house isn't going to last a thousand years. I mean, it'll be firewood long before then. Because everything was done so differently. When they're doing things like moving rocks, Lemurian monuments that are still out there remaining, and Atlantean, when they're moving rocks, you know, they didn't, they didn't have slaves like you see on History Channel. <laughs> you know, and they'll, they'll title these shows, The Real Bill Way They Built the Great Pyramids. And it still shows a bunch of people, oh, oh, you know, chain gang or whatever, you know. They would just ask the rock to do a certain thing. Uh, we're going to go over here now. Come on. And the rock would move. I know that sounds out there. According to ancient mythologies, they would write something on a papyrus, papyrus, lay it on the rock, and the rock would then follow the instructions laid on the rock. You don't have to believe in these things. Have lots of beliefs and non-beliefs, but there will come a time where you'll see the weaving together of all the truths. And it's going to all make sense when people learn to do that. Instead of it being like uh, segmenting. Well, I want to believe that, but I won't believe that. I want to believe, I want, don't want to believe. I believe Jesus was wonderful. I don't know that he could walk on water. I don't think that's possible. <laughs> you're deciding, and that means your opinions, which then means your ego is determining your belief systems. Yeah. Why not jump into, I want to believe as God believes. And if I'm going to do that, I could see anything's possible. And yes, immaculate conception makes sense to me. You're not hearing things that sound far out. What about all the, you know, the centaurs and all the, it sounds wild. Yep, I can totally see it. From the Lemurian projecting thing that went on to the Atlantean genetic manipulation that went on. And now the human race is all proud of itself because it's, it's doing like uh, the Atlanteans did. Hey, we're at the point where we can make, you know, people half human and half turnip. Wow, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, you think that's impressive, and yet it's not. Screwing around like the Atlanteans did with genetics and trying to make yourselves into pseudo-gods is not our goal. It's to get out of playing God, surrendering to the one and only, which is love. 
uh, I said that about a turnip, and it's kind of funny. This is just a quick aside, and then we're going to wrap up. I remember when I was a kid, my mind was still very metaphysical. And I mean, I was just little, and I heard somebody say, you know, this is adults talking, you know, they're saying that John F. Kennedy isn't really dead. He's, he's on life support. Um, he's a vegetable. And I went right into, you can go from a human reincarnating into a vegetable? I mean, little, you know, this little kid, and I'm already, I'm, I'm already thinking reincarnation. He incarnated as a vegetable? Poor thing, you know. Poor thing, you know. Kid mind, you know, kid mind. Um, but that's about like my daughter when she was little thought serial killers was people that broke in your house at night and ripped up your boxes of cereal. I mean, this is a childlike mind. I mean, it's beautiful in a sense. So, so I know, isn't that funny? Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's because she was my kid. Anyway, so it's sort of coming to a close now. Um, you could say that the Lemurians made it a point in general to say we need to remember. And the Lemurians had very hyper-developed pineal and pituitary glands, by the way. Very hyper-developed. So now when, when um, science says mankind's pineal gland is just a, a throwback, they don't know what it is or what it's for, but they just kind of go, well, whatever it was, mankind must have used it once upon a time, and it's now atrophying, and it'll eventually be gone. That's not. It's mankind stopped using this consciousness, therefore the gland is atrophying. But in the Lemurians, it was very hyperdeveloped. What does the pineal gland do? It has a tail, like a polywog, and it flutters when light hits it. But there's no light in your skull, or is there? So why would you have a gland that responds to light? Because the inner light would awaken it and it would give you awareness. It would give you vision. So some animals, now you see a, a flock, let's say of birds, and they're going like this and then they all go all at the same time. I mean, you know, how do they do that? Like, it's so bizarre. It's like, are, are they trained? Did one of them have a, a whistle that humans can hear? Ready, everybody? Uh, humans are watching. Everybody get ready. To the right. To the left. They're all one. That's what's happening. So when they say right, they go right. When they, it's, it's a, a we, we, and we, and that's what happens. Humans think it was impressive to separate from each other. Segment, they call it individual, you know, individuation or individualization. And we think that's impressive. It's, it's really not all it's cracked up to be. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Jesus said, when Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, he should have said, I think, therefore I'm not. As soon as he started thinking that you can think independently and be a little I, a little tyrannical I, you lost sight of who you are. I think, therefore I'm not, should be, I choose not to think, therefore I am. And I know that sounds weird to some people. I want my thinking, which is why you're here. We're going to be able to move from I think, therefore I am, to I accept, I have faith in us, and we're in this together. We need to move a little right, we need to move a little left, I understand it. If this group is taken over by ego, I can download more light to the group to feed off of to help bring them home, which is what a teacher, a parent, or whatever is a healer should be doing, seeing themselves as simply a little more choosing awakening, therefore they can help the, the group, but they're still part of the group. As soon as the teacher, the mother, whatever, you know, pulls away from and we're better than, you're split off again, therefore you're not. So, in a sense, the, the Lemurians, you could imagine, their civilization was all about going home. And that's why we had, you know, years later you had schools and so forth and temples, but this is how they lived. What we now know, your, your Harry Potter magic school. It would be like that the children would be getting trained on having more magical abilities, but not quite in the you know, three-dimensional version of like a movie like that. But it's like that, magical abilities. And they you know, say incantations and be able to do things. But it wasn't for the purpose of fighting each other. It was, it was how you lived. 
you knew how to say lights on, lights off, long before the clap on. <laughs> you know, you know, and the lights, you know, it's, it's, of course, it's consciousness. We're, you know, why would we decide to stay limited in any form other than going all the way is, you could say is beyond me or beyond some of us, but if you think about it, there's really only one answer, it's fear. And that's what it means to say people are afraid of their true power. You're, we're, human beings are afraid of their true magical abilities. Are you thinking it's only the magic? No. The reason people are afraid of remembering their true magical abilities is because they're first going to have to take responsibility for acting very unmagical. And that is too much for them. Even though we know the gift down the end is great. God, I could really get to the place where I can manifest anything, really? Yeah, but first you have to, oh, never mind. I'll just go back to sleep again. Because I, I do not want to own my miscreations. But if you know they're miscreations, then you'll know they're called illusions. And if they're illusions, you don't have to be afraid of them. Oh, but I'm terrified of them. Okay, never mind, go to sleep. Because <laughs> that is technically the safest place to be. Asleep. Even A Course in Miracles will tell you. The Holy Spirit will not come in and bring you to higher consciousness if it terrifies you. So it's going to be a day at a time. And those who say, give me a quantum leap, become the masters on this planet. And we go, wow, how amazing. This guy, Michael, is he's teaching, or this teacher over there, this master from the past. We, we think it's amazing, but that's nothing compared to where we're all going. But we think it's so much safer to take one guy, set them up on a podium, or they've written a book or whatever, and go, wow, aren't they amazing? That's one reason we do it. Segment them out and place them there. But where did they come from? You. That's your magic manifesting at the podium. That's your light in that healer. But you want to act like it's them because that keeps you nice and safe, not owning it, your own magic. And I'm not saying don't go to the teachers, don't go to the healers. Go to them and own that they're part of you. They would be able to work on you far more if you accepted your one with them. You know, instead of just projecting, well, you're the healer and I don't know, you know, I'm just all broken and I need your help because you're special. It's okay to see them as special in a sense, but you're also special as well. So why don't you join your specialness with theirs and they'll be able to know exactly what to do for your spine or your muscles or your joints or whatever else it happens to be. Why? Because they'll know who you are. Why? Because like in Lemuria, they'll be able to send out a frequency to say what's, what's going on and it'll come back. And when that signal hits him, oh, the, the target is three miles away to the you know, southwest, etc. Meaning they'll tune in and go, you know what this is? This is, you know, chiropractor. It used to be crunch, crunch, you know, whatever. Now it's going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. you know, the guy's going to be doing smudge and rattles and he'll be just the etheric body and go, you know what's happening? This is a spear wound from five lifetimes ago. You know, healing's going to become healing instead of a linear topic. You know, you won't be a chiropractor or a surgeon. I'm a healer. And you just stay open and anything comes to you that needs done. That's what healers are going to look like more and more because that's what they looked like once upon a time. There was no segmenting, no limitation. It's how can I help you today? I put myself before you. You tune in and you can tell exactly what's going on for me. Just like parenting should be. Please take a few centering breaths. Ah, breathing all this. That's a transmission. It's a channeling. There's a frequency. It took the form of words in a talk, but that's not what's really happening. You can hear today as a talk you don't like, very dense. You can hear it as a talk you do like, less dense. Now you're raising vibration. You can hear it as a talk that was extraordinary and magical, beyond even words. And now you're going higher. Then, beyond the words, there's an experience. Something happened today. It took me into the cosmos, but don't analyze the cosmos. Civilizations, vibrational conversations. All of a sudden, I just feel like I'm opening. So let the talk now go from speaking to experiential. Hmm. 
this will expand as far as you allow it to. Remain the witness so that you're present, but also go. wonderment, at the very least, let your mind enjoy the wonderment, the realization that, wow, this has always been true. The, the magical abilities of our consciousness, it's always been true. And throughout history, there have been children of God trying to get us home. So tune into it. Try this, accepting that you're not a mere human being. Try tuning into, do I feel like I've ever heard the term, felt the term, was the term, bearer of light, a light bearer, children of light, children of the one. The Lemurians were often called children of the sun, children of the law of God. Today, a term that I came up with back in the 80s, it's commonly used now, light workers. Tune into it, guys. You, you know the term. You, there's a feeling to it. You've done this work at some capacity. I remember being a, like a child of the sun. I remember the tropical, beautiful place we once lived. I remember the enormous trees like the redwoods. I remember vibrations from flowers and essences. I remember living in frequency and consciousness, not density. Tune into it. Try to remember it so it can start like time, time, release, time release capsules. So it starts kind of popping open cellular memory of a more magical time. The Divine Mother is blessing this like all of our services. And she, when you're allowing this, she's weaving into your mind and she'll work dependently, independently with you in what you need to start opening neurons to remember. This is not only possible, this is inevitable. So let's just speed it up and get there, allowing this to open and open and open. People that are asleep are afraid. They're often violent, hurtful, selfish, of course. That's what people do when they're afraid. They act out. And there are some of those. That's the sleeping people act out angrily. But sleeping people are also often victims because they don't step up and say no. So whether you're aggressive or hyper-passive, it's still extremes of those who are asleep. Where do you really want to be? The center. So what we're seeing is people once upon a time lived in their center. That's where I'm coming from now. That's what I'm choosing to be now. More and more from my center. I can step up or step back, but not excessively. I'm a light worker. I'm awake. I can prosper without taking from others. I just prosper. I can teach without preaching. I can love without attachment. Center, center, center. <sighs> remind me, remind me, Holy Spirit, and allow this to expand in my being and to continue blossoming. Then I become more and more like I was as a guide in Lemuria. Hmm. Lastly, just feel like you're soaking that in, sort of owning that, really anchoring this is not just a meditation or a visualization, a reality. I really, truly get this. 
I really feel like I'm integrating this into my being. And I give thanks that today, not only am I feeling this, but I also understand it. In many ways that I don't even know, I get this. There's one truth teaching under all the mythologies and everything else, and we're getting back to that, and that's my choice today. And so it is. Nice job. Isn't that nice? What's, what's you know, these humans? Oh, my God. <laughs> that's, that's a phrase that pops out of my mouth. I don't mean it in any, like, hyper-rude way, but it just, I, some show or some, whether it's history or whatever, I'm, I'm just, I just think, God, these humans, man, they're just, like, so strange. How can they not see this, you know? How do they not know this? How do they not see the connection to things? Let's talk about Brahma and Saraswati. But wait, Bra isn't there a connection? Think about this. How, how often have you ever heard this? Brahma, Saraswati. What about Abraham and Sarah? <laughs> Did anybody ever stop to think? That maybe, even though one seems to be Far East Indian, no, Brahma and Saraswati. Abraham and, and Sarah were being embodiments of them. Dense human versions, but they were living that archetype. Their names are the same, for God's sakes. And yet, you know, people, oh, no, no, there's no connection. It's just funny to me, but it's understandable. Separated minds see everything as separate. Well, let's not be separated minds. Let's get back to one-mindedness and we see the connection. And to me, it's wonderful to see those connections. It's, it's so exciting. There are days when I think, when everybody gets that, what a day of celebration. These two tribes beating up on each other. Well, we're better than you. Wait, sorry, we're you. <laughs> you know, you were attacking them, but that was you were attacking yourself. You were harming other people. You're a narcissist. You know, and you're, you're acting out, but that's you, experiencing you. You know, you just, it's, it's an amazing thing when you see everything as projection, projection that comes back around eventually. So thank you so much for sharing this time with us. Please stand for our closing prayer. The connectedness. Oh, breathe it in, the connectedness. Native American and other continents, cultures, Guys, now when you see a show and you see them use those short terms, dot, 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 you know, you realize, oh my God, that was vibrational representations. The beautiful language, you know, listen to uh, Cherokee and Apache, but Hopi, listen and then go indigenous people of every culture. And it's like, wow, there's, they're, they're talking vibrational representations, not memorized words and meanings that came from someone else. It's what are you and I'm experiencing you and then words. Hmm. Giving deep thanks that the light of God surrounds us. We are, we are the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. We are the love of God. The power of God protects us. We are the power of God. And the presence of God watches over us. We are the presence of God. Wherever we go, God, God is, is, I am, we, we are. are. Take a deep breath, and so it is. Take a deep breath, and a sound. Keep going. Take a breath when you need, and keep going. going. Let the sound represent what you heard today, what you learned today. Tune in to all of the all and let the all make a sound through you. Become the sound. We're not formu formulating words yet, but at least a sound. Now own that sound, let it vibrate in you, as you, through you, 
And now lastly, send it out to all others, to your brothers and sisters throughout creation. Peace be with you all. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks online, folks. <laughs>